Okay, so welcome back once again to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. Go West, go Wolves. This video will be the third one in a series that will have to do with getting started in existential psychology. In the previous video, what we did was we looked at the question, is existentialism, properly speaking, a mode of philosophy or not? And we noticed that the answer is in some ways yes, in some ways no. The way in which it's not quite so easy to characterize existentialism as a mere mode of philosophy is that it's up to a somewhat different, much more evocative, aesthetic in a way, project than philosophy typically does. So uh, basically what that's about is a project having to do with awakening us to the reality of existence, which is to say the reality of life, rather than sort of playing uh, neatly <laughs> in a nice, neat, confined way within uh, the boundaries of rational discourse. So uh, existentialism, among its other charms, attempts to broaden out the range of what we usually think thinking is and what understanding things is and so on. And in that regard, it's definitely not playing a vanilla philosophical game. That's all stuff from last time. What we have on the plate for today is uh, I want to continue unpacking that first question, that common way of understanding what existentialism is about and noticing ways in which it's true and noticing ways in which it's not. So once again, to remind you what that initial uh, thing is, Existentialism is, in common parlance, something like a somewhat gloomy, atheistic, and individualistic philosophy of existence. So what I want to do today is take up those three uh, adjectival descriptors. So gloomy, atheistic, and individualistic, all right, and ask the question, is existentialism really that? So let's look at atheism first. Is existentialism inherently atheistic? And you can already anticipate the answer to this because I've been telling you through the last two videos that all the answers are going to be yes and no. In some ways it is, in some ways it is not. Okay, so how is existentialism uh, atheistic? Well, the thing is that probably this mostly comes by, to us by way of Jean-Paul Sartre, who more than anyone else in the 20th century uh, pro uh, did the most to popularize existentialism and propagate it across the larger social terrain and not merely within the relatively isolated cloistered domain of intellectuality. So for Sartre, existentialism uh, definitely is atheistic. He's right up front about it. He doesn't uh, he doesn't pull his punches. Actually, the Parisian intellectuals never pull their punches, but he's right up front about it, right in your face about it, and Albert Camus, kind of same way. In fact, uh, the French existentialists generally, not all the time, because, uh, you know, Marcel, for one, uh, wasn't this way, but um, generally speaking, uh, they, uh, they tend toward the atheistic. All right, so in those regards, yeah, um, it probably seems like existentialism is an atheistic mode of understanding, thinking, intellectuality, what have you. But the thing is, once you get into the broader terrain of other thinkers, all of a sudden you can start finding ones that are very theistic in nature. And that starts off with the progenitor of the whole movement, Soren Kierkegaard, who is a very ardent hard to imagine a more ardently uh, Christian theistic thinker than Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, and he's the one that started it all off in the uh, first half of the um, 19th century. Uh, another uh, name that you'll encounter this semester is Martin Buber, who is probably every bit as equally ardent about his theism, but his theism is from a Judaic perspective more than a Christian Protestant perspective like uh, Kierkegaard's was. Uh, at any rate, the point is that some thinkers are atheistic, that's true, but other ones are theistic. Still other ones are more agnostic. It's like they have this idea that, well, we really don't know enough to determine whether God exists or whether we should take the idea of God seriously or not. And uh, still other ones adopt a fourth position, and you may wonder what the fourth position might be, because it's like, well, either you're a theist or you're an atheist or you're an agnostic, and you think that, well, we don't know enough to be able to say whether God exists or not. There's actually a fourth position, if you think about it, and the fourth position is people who just don't care enough about the question to have any of the other three positions. It's like they're into other things in life, seemingly, 
and the issue is of no concern to them or very little concern. So you can find existentialists of that persuasion too. They're just up to something completely different. So what's the upshot? The upshot is that existentialism as a whole is not inherently atheistic any more than it's inherently theistic, any more than it's inherently agnostic, any more than it's inherently I don't care enough to have a position about it. Because you can find thinkers of all four of those persuasions within the domain of existentialism. So existentialism, yeah, some, some of them are atheistic, but lots of them aren't. Okay, so similar kind of deal with respect to this next question. So is existentialism uh, irreducibly individualistic? Because it has that reputation too, that it's a very individualistic philosophy. And it's the same kind of deal as with atheism. So yes, there are definitely thinkers within the existential tradition who are very individualistically oriented. I would number Kierkegaard among those. And I gave you sort of an example, like he wanted his epitaph to be simply the individual. If you look up his tombstone uh, on the internet and uh, see the translation from the Danish, um, it doesn't actually say the individual, but he supposedly wanted his epitaph to be the individual. Sartre in uh, No Exit, we find this kind of, uh, is it more famous or infamous pronouncement, hell is other people, and that sort of makes existentialism seem pretty darn uh, individualistic in orientation. But here, once again, same kind of deal as with atheism. You can find other thinkers for whom sociality and the interpersonal relationship is, is every bit as important as what we are as individuals. So I gave you a couple examples of that. Martin Buber, whose name I just got done mentioning, all real living is meeting. Uh, for Buber, it's all about how we address each other in the world more generally. Like, real life happens in the between, always, in relation, always, for Martin Buber. Okay, Martin Heidegger, and here I'm going to flash you back to our very first video in this series where I was talking about, remember those three interbraided regions uh, that ultimately constitute Dasein or being in the world, and I gave them German names, and uh, one of those German names was Umwelt, and one of them was Mitwelt, and the other one was Eigenwelt. Well, Mitwelt, we described earlier, is the world of sociality, culture, interpersonal relationships, the with world, literally translated from the German, Mitwelt, with world. Okay, you know, so well, what does that mean? That well, Heidegger, for one, uh, regards sociality and our connection with our fellow human beings as at the ground level of being itself. <laughs> okay, well, that seems pretty odd for a mode of philosophy that would, would seemingly be all about individuality. So, well, okay, so same upshot as before. It's like you can find thinkers for whom individuality seems paramount. You can find other thinkers for whom sociality seems at least as important, if not paramount, in its own right. Okay, so same kind of deal. Now, third question. This one's going to probably take a little longer to get through. Um, is existentialism gloomy? Once again, answer yes and no. Okay, so in what ways is it gloomy? Well, by the end of the semester, you're probably going to get a pretty deep appreciation for how um, often existential thinkers will explore the darker and more difficult regions of life. They do it with some fair frequency, and I gave you a bunch of examples there in your notes. So, dread, a la Kierkegaard, uh, anxiety, a la Heidegger, nausea, a la Sartre, resentment, a la Nietzsche, alienation, Kafka, and so on. So they, t they are definitely not shy at all about talking about these darker and more difficult experiences and regions of life. And if that's not enough for you, they tend to talk a lot about death, to put the icing on the cake, and the importance of uh, our confronting the reality of our mortality. Part of the reason, uh, general reason for that is because, well, you know, <laughs> our mortality is part of what defines our existence, right? You only have a whole life insofar as you're going to die at some point. And that may seem like a counterintuitive point, but if it's counterintuitive, to think of the opposite. It's like, suppose you never died. In a way, you would never have a whole life. Why is that? Because there'd always be more streaming out to be done along that infinite horizon. It's only the fact that we die that gives us a life as such. All right? So <laughs> the, the upshot is that, well, you know, what life is and what death is are always mutually defining one another. Okay? So it's not just that we have life. We also have death. All right. 
So they tend to talk a lot about death and confronting the reality of death. They tend to destabilize our easy answers to life's riddle. They tend to underscore the inherent uh, ambiguity, uncertainty, and insecurity of human existence, that we don't really know what the hell's going on if we're honest about it. Usually we're not that honest about it, but when we are occasionally honest about it, you have to admit that we actually know precious little about what the damn rules of the game are. We're just sort of thrown in here and we're all improvising as best we can as the actual reality. And all of that taken together would seemingly generate a very dark, gloomy, and ultimately paralyzing worldview. And so that's the sense in which existentialism seems gloomy. But that's not, in a way, that's not existentialism's intent. Existentialism's intent is to be more honest about how life actually is than we typically are. Okay, so how we typically are with respect to life is, it's like, uh, I think this might be more especially true in the United States maybe than in other places around the world, but it's like we always have to sort of put on a happy face about everything, you know, and like everyone's sort of happy and happy people, like meeting other happy people, and we sort of uh, have this idea that it's almost rude, in a sense, to admit that you're having a tough time in life or you're dealing with some dark thoughts or that you're, you're plagued by ongoing uh, anxieties about your eg our existential lot and that um, you know we're plagued by sort of demons and that we don't necessarily make rational, coherent sense all the time. It's almost rude to admit these kinds of things, you know. In, in the culture of the United States and probably in other places too. It's just that I'm used to the culture of the United States. Um, and well, you know, um, existentialists, uh, they want to go there. They want to go there. So, but the animating spirit is not to generate a gloomy sort of, you know, sort of goth or emo type worldview. It's just to be honest, to be freaking honest about life, right? And the fact is that a lot of life is dark and it doesn't make sense and it is absurd and it is incoherent and it is anxiety provoking and we are scared at some level. So if you're not scared, you're probably not being honest enough with yourself, like at some level, you know? So, um, so really what they're, they're looking for, these existentialists, is a kind of liberation from all of the, uh, you know, sort of socially sanctioned, nicey, nicey, polite talk. So they're, they're, they want to be real about things, and that's the animating spirit of it, uh, and not so much just to be dark for its own sake, you know? Like, um, in fact, you know, when you think about it, uh, here's a thought experiment for you. Like, what really is a dark, debilitating, paralyzing view of life really all about? Like, if you think about, like, try to think of one. Um, here's one. Like, I think the, one of the darkest views of how life might be is the one where you got to slap a big happy face on your face all the time and act like everything's okay and participate in this like fake, phony, uh, socially sanctioned charade that like everyone is just like having a damn good time all the time and you can't ever admit to anyone else or even to yourself that you're struggling a little bit or that you know you, ha you have some uh, dark feelings or dark thoughts or that you are, you know what angst is about or that you do feel anxious or that you know you feel sort of the cold uh, tendrils of death on your shoulder every now and then. You know, like the, the real dark view is where you can't admit any of that. Instead, you got to slap a big old happy face on your face. Like, oh, everyone's like so happy, 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 happy. Oh, everyone just like so nice, so nice. And those are happy, like happy thoughts. People thinking happy thoughts all the damn time. Happy, happy, happy. Makes you want to go on a three-state killing spree after a while, doesn't it? You know, so um, I think if you really want a really sort of paralytic, nasty worldview, Get that one. Get that one. Where you're not allowed to be honest and real about what life is. Okay? But you have to, like, sort of, sort of dwell in this false candy land type of thing. You want a dark, paralyzing worldview? Try that one on for size. So, um... <laughs> Well, I'm getting slightly excited here, okay? So I guess that's okay. All right, so, uh, okay, why am I saying that? Because I want you to sort of wonder and think about it, you know, like really is being honest, even if it contravenes a certain measure of our socially sanctioned politesse, 
all right, even if that's the case, is that really dark and debilitating? Or is the darker view the one where you're never allowed to, that, to do that? You always have to say the damn appropriate, like, nicey thing all the time, you know? Ugh, God. This way to hell, all right? This way to hell, all right? This way to the next totalitarian gulag, all right? Good for what ails you, okay? That is sarcasm, by the way. Okay, so now Jean-Paul Sartre, famous French existentialist, I just mentioned his name a minute ago, calls this basic will to honesty existentialism's optimistic toughness. This is his phrase in translation, okay? So optimistic toughness. Okay, so the tough part is that we're willing, you know, to be honest, or existentialism is willing to be honest about the dark and difficult parts of life. The optimistic part is that you can be honest about that and still find life worth living anyhow. Okay, that's the optimistic part. That ultimately, the facts are friendly. Okay, facts may seem dark and intimidated, but ultimately, being real is toward the good. Uh, Albert Camus had a, uh, a nice pithy way of sort of getting at this idea. At one point he goes, uh, to try to get the translation correct, uh, the world that's real is not necessarily the world that's desirable. Okay, I'm adding a little bit to the translation to make it smoother, but uh, okay, so the world that's real is not necessarily the world that's desirable. Okay, so existentialists, they're interested in the world that's real. They're not interested in some damn fantasy, right? Like, oh, like a brighter and better world, let's make, make, make a nice utopian thing. They're not interested in that. They're interested in being world, in being real, excuse me. So, um, okay, so that's optimistic toughness. And really what... It, it, seems, um, it seems a little gloomy to people. The reason why is because it's a kind of optical illusion, right? It's like we're so not used to being real that when people are real, it seems like they're being gloomy. You getting it? Okay, so let's say that again because that might be a little counterintuitive for you. The reason why existentialism seems gloomy is because it contrasts so vividly with the world that we sort of conjure by way of our social practices that is very not real, very unreal. So anyone who's really honest about life is going to seem a little bit dark, because if you're honest about life, you're also going to be honest about the dark side of life. Okay? So it's, it's a kind of optical illusion, really, that existentialism is dark. Really, it's just real. Okay? Just seems dark in contrast to how we normally operate. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, okay, here's the other thing about the gloominess issue. Actually, existentialism, I mentioned that it likes to explore these difficult emotions and sensations and experience, but actually it also will explore with some fair frequency, maybe not as often as the darker ones, the positive side of things. So it'll talk about laughter and dance, a la Nietzsche, okay? Or it'll talk about uh, ecstatic reasoning like we talked about in the last video. Like, it'll speak the language of ecstasy. Existentialists will speak that language fairly often, okay? So they'll, they'll be all about the positive side, too. And the middle ground, which is where we spend a lot of our lives, you know, a lot of our lives is a, a lot of the music is right around middle C, you getting it? Like, um, so, uh, well, that's life, too. And existentialists will go there, too, right? So really what they're about is exploring the broad spectrum. And okay, the broad spectrum includes some dark colors over here and some dark notes on the left side of the keyboard, right? So dark, oh, like low, like like funeral dirge notes. But hey, man, that's part of life too. Every bit as much as the nicey, nicey notes up here. I'm going to hurt my voice doing this. That's how much I care about you, the tuition paying student. All right, so um, <laughs> that did kind of hurt my voice actually, but uh, that's okay, all right? Because hey, it's exemplifying it. Life has pain. Life has pain. You hurt your voice trying to do something. That's part of the equation. You getting it? You might as well be honest about it, All right? So, <laughs> you might as well. What the hell, man? What else are you going to do? Like, like, you know, just play your part in some damn fantasy? <laughs> All right. So, um, 
that's the other side of that. So let me read to end this video off a little bit from your notes. Uh, one last sentence in this section. Basically, existentialism seeks to illuminate and intensify the sense for simply being alive in all of its uncertainty, wonder, terror, absurdity, enchantment, and its danger and darkness. Okay, have a good day.